1633, the Roman Catholic Church condemned Galileo for teaching that the earth goes around the sun. Let's take a closer look at this famous controversy. In the preface to his book comparing the two hypotheses, an earth-centered and a sun-centered universe, Galileo had written these words. The celestial phenomena will be examined, strengthening the Copernican hypothesis until it might seem that this must triumph absolutely. And later in the book he confessed, Nor can I ever sufficiently admire Copernicus and his followers. They have, through sheer force of intellect, done such violence to their own senses as to prefer what reason told them over what sensible experience plainly showed them. The Church declared, in its indictment of Galileo, the doctrine that the earth is neither the center of the universe nor immovable, but moves even with a daily rotation, is absurd, and both psychologically and theologically false, and at the least an error of faith. Galileo replied, The doctrine of the movements of the earth and the fixity of the sun is condemned on the ground that the scriptures speak in many places of the sun moving and the earth standing still. It is piously spoken that the scriptures cannot lie, but none will deny that they are frequently abstruse and their true meaning difficult to discover, and more than the bare words signify. I think that in the discussion of natural problems, we ought to begin not with the scriptures, but with experiments and demonstrations. But in his recantation on June 22, 1633, Galileo was made to say these words, Having been admonished by the Holy Office entirely to abandon the false opinion that the sun was the center of the universe and immovable, and that the earth was not the center of the same, and that it moved, I have been suspected of heresy, that is, of having held and believed that the sun is the center of the universe and immovable, and that the earth is not the center of the same, and that it does move. I abjure with a sincere heart and unfeigned faith, I curse and detest the same errors and heresies, and generally all and every error and sect contrary to the Holy Catholic Church. It took the Church until 1832 to remove Galileo's work from its list of books which Catholics were forbidden to read at the risk of dire punishment of their immortal souls. To its credit, although belatedly and reluctantly, the Church in 1992 repudiated its denunciation of Galileo. It still cannot quite bring itself, though, to see the significance of its opposition. In a 1992 speech, Pope John Paul II argued as follows. From the beginning of the Age of Enlightenment, he said, down to our own day, the Galileo case has been a sort of myth in which the image fabricated out of the events is quite far removed from reality. In this perspective, The Galileo case was a symbol of the Catholic Church's supposed rejection of scientific progress or of dogmatic obscurantism opposed to the free search for truth." But surely the Holy Inquisition, ushering the elderly and infirm Galileo in to inspect the instruments of torture in the dungeons of the Church, not only admits, but requires just such an interpretation. This was not mere scientific caution and restraint, a reluctance to shift the paradigm until compelling evidence such as the annual parallax was available. This was fear of discussion and debate, censoring alternative views and threatening to torture their proponents, betray a lack of faith in the very doctrine and parishioners that are ostensibly being protected. Why were threats and Galileo's house arrest needed? Cannot truth defend itself in its confrontation with error? The Pope does, though, go on to add, quote, The error of the theologians of the time, when they maintained the centrality of the earth, was to think that our understanding of the physical world structure was in some way imposed by the literal sense of sacred scriptures, close quote. But if the Bible is not everywhere literally true, Which parts are divinely inspired 
and which are merely fallible and human. As soon as we admit that there are scriptural mistakes or concessions to the ignorance of the times, then how can the Bible be an inerrant guide to ethics and morals? Might sects and individuals now accept as authentic the parts of the Bible they like and reject those that are inconvenient or burdensome? We lack consensus about our place in the universe. There is no generally agreed upon long-term vision of the goal of our species, other than perhaps simple survival. Especially when times are hard, we become desperate for encouragement, unreceptive to the litany of great devotions and dashed hopes, and much more willing to hear that we're special, never mind if the evidence is paper thin. If it takes a little myth and ritual to get us through a night that seems endless, who among us cannot sympathize and understand? But if our objective is deep knowledge rather than shallow reassurance, the gains from this new perspective far outweigh the losses. The scientific revolution permitted us to glimpse an underlying, ordered universe in which there was a literal harmony of the worlds. If we understand nature, there is a prospect of controlling it, or at least mitigating the harm it may bring. In this sense, science brought hope. Most of the great deprovincializing debates were entered into with no thought for their practical implications. Passionate and curious humans wished to understand their actual circumstances, how unique or pedestrian they and their world are, their ultimate origins and destinies, how the universe works. Surprisingly, some of these debates have yielded the most profound practical benefits. The very method of mathematical reasoning that Isaac Newton introduced to explain the motion of the planets around the sun has led to most of the technology of our modern world. The Industrial Revolution, for all its shortcomings, is still the global model of how an agricultural nation can emerge from poverty. These debates have bread and butter consequences. It might have been otherwise. It might have been that the balance lay elsewhere, that humans by and large did not want to know about a disquieting universe, that we were unwilling to permit challenges to the prevailing wisdom. Despite determined resistance in every age, it is very much to our credit that we have allowed ourselves to follow the evidence, to draw conclusions that at first seemed daunting. A universe so much larger and older that our personal and historical experience is dwarfed and humbled. A universe in which every day suns are born and worlds obliterated. A universe in which humanity, newly arrived, clings to an obscure clod of matter. In everyday life, we often sense, uh, in the bedrooms of teenagers or in national politics, that chaos is natural and order imposed from above. While there are deeper regularities in the universe than the simple circumstances we generally describe as orderly, all that order, simple and complex, seems to derive from laws of nature established at the Big Bang, or maybe earlier, rather than as a consequence of belated intervention by an imperfect deity. God is to be found in the details, is the famous dictum of the German scholar Abbe Warburg. But amid much elegance and precision, the details of life in the universe also exhibit haphazard, jury-rigged arrangements, and much poor planning. What shall we make of this? An edifice abandoned early in construction by the architect? The evidence so far at least, and laws of nature aside, does not require a designer. Maybe there's one hiding, maddeningly unwilling to be revealed. Sometimes it seems a very slender hope.